<laughs> so it was fourth grade. And in my school, when you're fourth grade, the cool thing to do was to be in choir. So I had to be in choir. And I was a great singer, thank, thank goodness. And um, <clears throat> Sister Agnes Murray was the director of the choir. And one day, she, early on, she said, you know, something sounds terrible. Um, but I don't know what it is. I'm going to split you in half. You sing and you sing. And OK, it's over in here. OK, I'm going to split you in half again. You sing, you sing. And it came down to like me and another person. I was confident it was still that other guy. <laughs> so it turns out it was me. And, and instead of singing, they gave me a percussion. The sticks, the triangle, and the sandpaper. <laughs> So um, if you ever are next to me at church, um, you'll often see my wife look at me, which means you're really, really off key. So, um, <laughs> but I, I, I give it a try now and then anyway. So thanks to, where did the band go? You guys were awesome, really great. So I was telling some of the Agape Latte team, um, I've given a lot of talks in my life, some highly technical about things like hypersonic fluid mechanics, uh, some about leadership, some about just about anything. I've never talked about this. So this talk I'm more nervous and anxious about than anything I've ever done before. So, um, and about three weeks ago I was looking to back out of this, but then I met with the great team and they convinced me that I should go ahead and do it. So, uh, so here we go. So uh, the first thing I'm doing is I'm gonna change the title of my talk. So I picked, was it hop, skip, and a leap when I had a sense of what I was going to talk about, but I really didn't have the details. So I'm actually going to change it to something like, um, I'm blessed to walk with a limp. Okay, so we'll see, we'll see where, I, where, I, where I go with that. Um, so a little, bit, a, a little bit more about me. Born and raised in, in Buffalo. Um, went to Catholic elementary school. Went to a Jesuit high school, went to Carnegie Mellon down in Pittsburgh as an undergrad, went right to uh, grad school at Princeton, um, and then um, became a faculty member at Syracuse and was there for 28 years before, uh, before I came here. And um, I think it's fair to say, I mean, it's a fact to say I've been blessed in my life. Um, it's really been uh, what I would regard as kind of a, a kind of a straight and, and privileged path that I've had the opportunity to walk. Um, my, my parents um, were deeply in love, stayed married uh, forever, um, had brother and sister who were very, very good to me, grandparents who were supportive. Uh, so kind of a family life that was you know, kind of just uh, American pie normal and um, was really blessed there. I just mentioned all the schools that I went to. So, you know, Princeton, I was an engineer, so I, I got to go for, for free, but you know, my parents sacrificed to have me go to uh, a Jesuit high school. Uh, my, my dad was um, a middle school principal, so we didn't have a lot of money. Um, they sacrificed to have me go to, go to Carnegie Mellon. Um, you know, I always made sure that I was, you know, well, well fed and well clothed and well housed and well taken care of. And um, really, life has always been kind of easy. Um, in um, graduate school uh, at Princeton, I, I met my wife, got married. Uh, today, I uh, have two incredible kids, both in college, a freshman and, and a senior. Uh, their lives have been, have been very good. They've been healthy, um, have generally been very happy in, in their lives. And I've had a great and really easy professional life. So Syracuse University for 28 years. Um, really anything I was even interested in trying there, I had the opportunity to do. So I was a faculty member. I was pretty successful in that. I was department chair. I was associate dean. I was dean. I was vice chancellor and provost. And these things just kind of fell into my lap. I mean, I really, I really feel like I've led a very privileged life. I've worked hard. But you know, as I as I think about my life, it really has been um, I'm going to say pretty pretty easy. Um, so when the Agape Latte team asked me to come and talk about my faith life and how it um, you know, how it's intertwined with my personal and professional life, um, and then I looked, I watched some of the presentations from Provost Benson and Dean Pierce and Daria Graham, Graham and others, and they were like awesome. And there was really a, you know, a 
story told well that was compelling and it was like, wow, are you, are you sure you want me to do this? And they, they said yes. Um, but, you know, I thought about my faith life and really it has been, um, you know, there's this word that engineers use a lot, especially NASA engineers, nominal, right? If everything is just kind of normal, it's nominal. Nominal flight trajectory, a nominal um, whatever. And, and my life has been kind of, my faith life, kind of, you know, kind of the quintessential Catholic faith life. So my, my parents were very active in the church. Um, we had multiple priests who were um, in, in, the, in, the, in the family. We knew the bishop. Uh, really all of our family friends were from our, our church. Um, I already told you went to Catholic elementary school. Um, Almost everyone I knew was Catholic and kind of the faith was at the center of their life. So it was just kind of like, this is the way everybody is and this is the way life is. Um, so, you know, I, I recognized, especially after talking to the team, that I've um, you know, really been blessed by God to have this you know, really kind of straight and easy and privileged life. Again, I've, I've worked, but you know, things just seem to have fallen just right for me. So clearly, um, you know, when, when the team asked me to try to think about a lesson that I might share or a moral of the story, um, I mean, the moral of the story isn't incredibly meaningful, right? It's, hey, be born to great parents. <laughs> well, you know, if, if, you, if you aren't, there's not much you can do about, about that. Or um, be grateful uh, to God, give thanks, be grateful to others for what they've done for you. And I dare say you're already there, right? You're, I dare say you're all grateful for what you have. So there's not some profound lesson there. Um, so the Agape Latte team pushed me a little bit harder and said, well, you know, so we understand and respect that and that's, that's great, but come on, you know, we understand God was there the whole time, but you know, were there times when you had doubts? Were there times when you know, maybe you had to pray a little bit harder? Um, there times where maybe things just didn't go the way you wanted. And um, so I reflected on that, and, and I, I, I thought of actually some I mean, important times in my life, times that actually formed who I am in important ways. Um, and, you know, at these times, I, know, I think, you know, what's, the, what's the song, Jesus Take the Wheel? I mean, instead of... <laughs> Instead of being my co-pilot, Jesus actually had the, the at least the, the rudders. Um, so, um, so, you know, this kind of idyllic, easy life that I've had, you know, I still maintain. I'm, I'm really, really blessed and privileged. But I want to talk a little bit tonight about three times in my life that, um, you know, I actually, you know, I had not just prayers of thanks, but prayers of, of, of guidance and prayers of, questioning and prayers of, of really looking for, for help. And, and that's what I want to talk about a little bit. And, you know, I think in these times, you know, for me, my faith has always been there. I, I think it drives kind of who I am as a professional, as a person. But, you know, frankly, sometimes kind of on autopilot. And I think at these three times, it became more active for me. And I think in your life, whether, you know, you lead a privileged life or not, you'll have times when, you know, your faith is kind of in the background and it's there and you, you have a deep faith, but you're not, you know, you're not leaning against it the way that I'm going to say that I am these three times. So, um, so the first of these times I was uh, headed off to my sophomore year at Carnegie Mellon and um, my mom would drop me off at the train station and um, she was going to the doctor. And I said, Mom, why, why are you going to the doctor? Um, you know, after she dropped me off. Said, well, it's nothing. It's just a routine thing. And um, long story short, uh, two weeks later, my mom's in the hospital. Um, they told me over the phone in Pittsburgh that uh, she had some kind of blood disease, but don't, don't worry about it. I came home at Thanksgiving and learned she had leukemia. And um, my my girlfriend of, uh, in high school, her mom had had leukemia and had passed away. So for me, this was like a kind of a, a, a death sentence. So I um, came home at Christmas and it was in remission. It was like, this is incredible. This is wonderful. You know, my prayers are, are answered. All of our prayers are answered. 
And, and during this time, my mom um, developed a special devotion to Elizabeth Ann Seton, who I think had just become uh, the first American-born saint. I think, that's, I think that's right, the first American-born saint. And I mean, really a, a deep devotion. I told you we're, you know, we're close to a number of, of priests and, and nuns. So you know, when I was home for Christmas vacation, there was uh, you know, a, a lot of traffic in the house, people bringing communion to my mom and just sitting and praying with her and so on. Um, but, you know, she was in, in remission, and it was great, and I went off to school, and um, parents were supposed to come and see me at, uh, at Easter time. And the day before, they called and they said they couldn't because my mom had to go back in the hospital. So to make a longer story short, um, my, my mom died um, in May 18th of, of that year, my sophomore year. So the remission was, was short-lived. And, and there were... Um, you know, so you do a lot of lot of praying, and there's a period where you think, you know, geez, you know, God wasn't paying attention, and God didn't answer my 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 prayers. Um, but as I thought about the time, but certainly in hindsight, I mean, I am my mother's son. You know, so some people say that I'm a, a gentle person. Uh, if I am, it's because of it's because of my my mom. Um, but what I learned in my mom's illness and in her death is. Um, First of all, I watched my mom, who was really pretty sick. I mean, I, I talked to her on the phone that, that second semester. And, you know, sometimes she couldn't talk because of sores in her mouth and, and so on. But, but she was never complained. And I, I heard this directly from my dad. I mean, never complained, never said, why me? Never, you know, never cursed, never anything, but was really devoted to Elizabeth Ann Seton, really devoted to, uh, to her faith. Um, really in, until, she, until she went into a, into a coma. So, you know, there are times when I've faced difficult things in my life, whether it's a really challenging and turbulent flight, um, or whether it's, you know, your oral examination for your PhD or whatever, and I think about uh, the courage that my mom showed to really never lose faith, to never, um, never lose who, who she was and, and her, her belief. I also learned from my father uh, devotion and loyalty. Uh, so he was, I said, a principal of a, a middle school. Um, he was by her side um, every minute in the hospital from you know, the minute he got off of work, which was early, until sometimes 2, 3 in the morning. Sometimes he'd sleep there in the, in the hospital. Um, and just watching my father be devoted to my mother, in, including in her death, was really I mean, you'll learn something about about your 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 parents and how um, you know how how their faith matters to them. Um, and then I think for me the biggest thing was uh, you're in college. You know, I encourage all college students to really focus on themselves. This is the time in your life when when you really have to worry mostly about yourselves. And so that's kind of the mode I was in as a, as a college student. I have, a, I have a, as a college student, I have a brother who's five years younger. I have a sister who's two years older. My sister and my mother, you know, kind of really complex relationship. And um, when, when my mom died, I mean, my sister lost the opportunity to, you know, ask for her forgiveness and to say how much she loved her and stuff. And, you know, I knew my sister was having a really challenging time. My, my brother was, you know, um, you know, 14 years old, 15, yeah, 14 years old, and you know, was just trying to be a, a middle school student, and now his his mom was uh, was dead, and and watching my dad, my mom was the, the center of his life. So, um, you know, s somehow through my prayers, I focused on um, how I could help them. So, I think my kind of selfish grieving process or my self-centered grieving process was relatively short and I really focused on on the three of them and what I could do to support them and as a result you know, I, I was really able I think to handle my mother's death probably a lot easier than I would have would have would have been able to so um, so that, that's that story I mean clearly you know my mom's faith was central in her illness and um, I learned an awful lot from that, but also saw how it touched really ev everyone in the, in the family and a lot of her friends and, and family who really also admired her, her courage. So, um, so, so clearly for that, yeah, I mean, Jesus did take the wheel and, and help me, me through that. 
So the um, so the, the the second episode that I'll talk about a little bit is um, so I was in graduate school. I met a girl. Um, my I've told a couple of you. My college experience at Carnegie Mellon was really mundane. I mean, it was anti-University of Dayton. Um, <laughs> I mean, every, every day I, I woke up, I went to class, I came home, I did my problem sets, I went to bed. I woke up, I went to class, I did my problem sets, I went to bed. And the weekend, I could do more problem sets. I mean, really, my, my college career was really, really, and, and you know, and Carnegie Mellon's a great university, and I think it's gotten better, but I mean, that was kind of like, that's what we all, all did. It was really a, it was a joyless experience. It's probably the best. <laughs> I'm serious. That's, that's the way, that's the best way to describe my undergraduate career. So, so off, I, off I toddled to, to Princeton um, right, right after graduation, and just kind of immediately met a whole bunch of really, really, really amazing people, incredibly smart, incredibly well-rounded, and, and had... Yeah, you know, over the next five, five and a half years, we worked incredibly hard and played incredibly hard. I mean, you name it, we did it. We golfed, we uh, won the intramural championships, we went to New York, we went to Philadelphia, we went to baseball games and football games, and we also worked our tails off. I think we didn't sleep for, for five and a half years. And, and just this whole, this whole group of, of people who are still really important to me, um, it really just... Uh, really the experience of my life. Um, so there was a girl who was part of this group and it's kind of an exotic, uh, exotic girl. I won't describe any more because I don't want this to get out on the web. Um, <laughs> but uh, in the middle of grad school we got, we got married and um, it was wonderful and the next two and a half years we were still among all our friends and it was great and then took a job at S Syracuse and um, yeah, continue to push hard and work on the relationship. And um, third year, she came to me and said, you know, I'm just not feeling it. I want a divorce. So I've told you, I've lived this kind of normal, all-American life. I don't get divorced, right? I mean, it's just not what I do. Um, I, sh I shouldn't. I can't. I mean, people don't, you know, I, I don't get divorced. People don't get divorced. Um, and uh, nonetheless, she didn't, she didn't buy that argument for me. <laughs> So uh, she really want to wor work on the relationship. So, um, you know, so I actually turned to uh, a, a priest who, uh, who actually meant, meant a lot to me until he passed away, Monsignor Buckle. And he, he helped me a lot. My father helped me. My family helped me. And um, eventually that, that marriage was, was annulled. Um, but, you know, the overwhelming feeling I had was I'm... I'm damaged, right? I mean, I'm, how old was I? I was uh, 27 years old and divorced, right? So, you know, I thought about having kids and, you know, who was going to want to marry a divorced 27-year-old guy? So, um, you know, so I, I, felt, I felt wounded. I felt, I felt damaged. And um, I have my best friend in my department, fellow mechanical engineer, uh, Call him Ed because that was his name. Um, <laughs> st that still is his name. Um, so Ed, Ed and Sue uh, were dear friends to my former wife and me, and um, she kind of blew everybody off. And Ed and Sue became became my friends. And this, this is August, September, and um, they they're not not Catholic. They're uh, Protestant, but um, you know, we began just sharing more about our, our faith lives. And um, you know, sometimes I'd go to a service in the middle of the week uh, at, at their church, and sometimes they'd come to mine. And we just did a lot of, a lot of talking about, about faith, how it can be tested, how you, how you respond. And um, you know, it was really, really meaningful time in my life to just kind of be alone again, um, but then to connect and, and to have you know, a kind of conversation about faith be a part of my life until that point, I mean, going through grammar school and high school and Catholic school, I mean, religion was something you studied rather than kind of lived. So now I had this time in my life where, you know, again, I, I mean, damaged, I think, is the perfect word. I really felt damaged. So, um, so this is a really special time with my friends Ed and Sue. 
And um, one of these evenings, we went to a service at, at their church. And there's a scripture reading from Genesis about, about Jacob. And people know the story of Jacob and Esau. Uh, so Jacob steals uh, Esau's birthright and then kind of d disappears and lives high off the hog. And at some point, Jacob um, c comes back to meet with Esau to look for his, his forgiveness. And in, in the desert, uh, he comes upon and wrestles with, and there's lots of debate. Father Jim could probably tell us, is it God? Is it an angel? But the interpretation that I heard for, you know, at that time from my friends is um, that Jacob wrestled with an angel. And you know, it was really a, f a fierce wrestling match. And you know, testing Jacob's faith. And um, at some point during the battle, uh, Jacob's hip is, is pulled out of joint. And they continue to battle, and um, hip goes, goes back in, and then finally uh, Jacob and the angel agree to stop wrestling, and Jacob asks for um, the blessing of the angel. And the angel blesses, um, blesses is Jacob. Um, so then, after the battle, uh, Jacob walks away with a limp, for, forever scarred, uh, from his battle with the angel, but blessed by, by the angel, blessed by um, really the same individual who, 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 who damaged, um, who damaged um, Jacob, damaged his hip. So we had a really good conversation that night of, over dinner about what that meant, and you know, my, my friends really just nailed it. I mean, that was, that was me. I mean, I, I was Jacob. Um, I had a, a limp. Right? I, I was divorced. I was damaged. Jacob was damaged with a, with a hip. But he walked away from that blessed. Um, and you know, they helped me to understand that my limp didn't need to define me. Um, in fact, it kind of made me who I was. And what, did I, what did I learn during the period of, of, of developing that, that limp? So um, that Easter, um, I, 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 met a, I met another girl, and most a lot of you know her. It's my wife, Karen. And um, early in our relationship, we hit it off pretty, pretty well. And early on, uh, I forget what I said, but basically, you know, I asked, you know, but I'm divorced. You know, isn't that a, aren't you hung up on that? I'm damaged. And, um, she, you know, she looked at me and said, no. I mean, that, that's part of who you are, and if you didn't go through that, then we wouldn't be here together. And I mean, just the way, I mean, she didn't tell the story of Jacob and Esau, but really she gave the same message. I mean, whatever damage you have, you know, makes you who you are and really is a blessing. Um, and, you know, that softness and gentleness with which she said that, um, kind of, again, some of you know Karen, that's, that's kind of who, who she is. So, um, the, the end of that story is that Karen, remember Ed? Uh, Karen is Ed's sister. So, um, so it all kinds of, all kind of work, works out. Um, so so those, are, those are, for me, two kind of challenging things. I mean, your mom dies when you're in, in college, and you're married, not terribly young. I was married when I was in grad school, so it's not like I was 17 or 16 or something. I, I, I thought I had it all together. Um, but I, I chose for the wrong reasons. I kind of married my graduate school experience. But you know, with with uh, you know, really a, a, a period of intense faith and intense discussion about my faith with people who are really close to me and you know, my in-laws, um, I was able to get through that in a way that you know, clearly, um, you know, I, I think my faith got me through that in an important way. So then, uh, the last thing that I would touch on, really, no, no kind of negative side to this one. Um, I was in Syracuse University for 28 years, as happy as a clam, a lot, lot of good friends, loved the area, um, met my wife there, um, kids, kids grew up there, um, and for a variety of reasons I kind of lifted my head up and, and looked around for, for a change from a professional perspective. And after 28 years you really don't think you're going to go anywhere. I was planning to live the rest of my life in, in Syracuse. And, um, and Dayton calls. And um, you know, some of you have heard this kind of 
not apocryphal, you know, kind of tr true story when the headhunter called me up and said, so what do you, what do you think of the University of Dayton? And I said, well, I think it's a Catholic school and I know it's in Dayton. <laughs> um, and that's, that's pretty much what I, what I knew about, about this university at the time. And, um, you know, I was not inclined to pursue it, but for, you know, over the next probably six to eight weeks, a number of things happened, advice from some key people, certain things that I read on the web, um, discussion with my, um, my, my mentor, my former chancellor at, at Syracuse. I, I, I pursued this and was ultimately offered, offered the job. Um, and you know, it really came down to, uh, for my wife and me, I wasn't going to move without, without Karen wanting to move. Because <coughs> I mean, 28 years, you really you build, you build a life. It came down to two things, whether or not we were to take this job. One was, you know, can, can we envision living in Dayton? And the other one, you know, do I, you know, I've, I've worked in this secular university for 28 years. And I've, I've over here, and I've had a Catholic faith life over here. You know, do we think I can bring those together? Am I qualified to bring bring them together? And um, so these were the two key questions that we really kind of talked over for a long time and and, and prayed over. The first one, uh, those of you who aren't from Syracuse, so you're probably saying, you lived in Syracuse. You could live anywhere. <laughs> Um, but nonetheless, Syracuse was, was home. So, you know, we had to make sure that Dayton was a good fit, and, and, and pretty quickly we did. I mean, the people, the area, we went to Roost downtown, that told us we could definitely live here. Um, but, but then, the, you know, as, as I framed it for some people, kind of the Catholic thing, that was the central question. I mean, you know, I, I knew what to do in a private, secular university. I knew well, I was only interim chancellor for four months. I was kind of the num number two for a long time. And I knew how to run a university. And I knew how to go to church. <laughs> I knew how to pray. But, you know, could I bring these together? And um, you know, so lots of, lots of conversations, including with uh, you know, Father Jim and others, uh, got me to a place where, um, you know, I, I knew I wasn't going to be able to answer the question definitively. I'm an engineer, right? I, I couldn't, it wasn't going to be an exact solution with yes, you know, under the, the total line. Um, but I got to a place where, you know, really I just kind of put my, put my faith and Karen put her faith in, in God and we, we leapt. So that's where the original title came from. Um, I mean, we, we, we took a leap, um, a, a leap of, of faith and you know, I think if it had just been up to me, um, I probably would have stayed at, at Syracuse. Um, but but I um, was really very comfortable. Lots of great friends. Kids had lots of great friends. It was two hours to my father. Um, but you know, there there was someone had the stick for the for the uh, for the aircraft, and 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 we we left and. Uh, you know, my wife and I are very busy with the university, but from time to time when we're out to dinner alone on an off night, um, halfway through dinner, one or the other of us will look at the other one and say, can you believe we're in, we're in Dayton? And like, we love it. Can you believe how good the people are and how good the university fits? Um, and it is hard to believe, but it, but it is true. And um, I mean, for me, I'm sure you know, God has been there throughout my life. But you know, these three things, including this decision to to do something totally crazy at an old age like I am, um, you know, God, God, God was, God was there. So um, again, this isn't an incredibly profound moral of the story. Um, maybe a little bit more profound than be born to good parents and be thankful. Um, <laughs> You know, there are times when you can just be cruising along, not having to actively think about your faith. I mean, you live it, it's internalized. But there are other times when you're really going to need it because there are questions and there's doubts and there's difficult things. Um, and in both of those times, I mean, God, God is always there. But it's, you know, you can definitely feel uh, his hand during, during those critical times. So that's, um, that's my story. So that's it. And now you know all my deep, dark secrets.
I don't go here anymore, so I didn't know oh. how long to answer questions. <laughs> but it depends what it is. <laughs> um, well, I, I am the person here with the littlest flyer, and a uh, proud alumni, and as I think of raising her, raising her in her faith life, um, today's world, a lot of people say that engineers, science, faith, all don't go together. So you pick the school that is kind of like yourself. We have an engineering department, and we have a chapel, and they're both great. Um, <laughs> could you comment maybe about how you bridge those two together, and how you see them working together? Hmm. Um, so just recently, someone interviewed Jimmy Carter. I can't remember who it was. Oh, it was um, Nick Kristoff, I think, interviewed uh, Jimmy Carter right before Easter. Essentially asked him that question. Um, really, the question was something like, you know, do you really believe the Easter story? And, and Jimmy Carter, who is, you know, an, an incredible model in terms of faith and conviction and so on, um, essentially answered, you know, not these words, these are uh, abbreviated, but, you know, faith is faith. And, um, you know, I, my, my faith is, is very deep. Um, and um, on, on the other side, on the other side of your question, um, you know, I believe in science too. I've seen, you know, I've done lots of experiments, <laughs> and and I can see, you know, how physics works and chemistry works and biology works. Um, I, I don't I don't see, and I you know, you know maybe I'm biased, but I, I know an awful lot of people who are able to balance faith and reason. Um, I don't think they've ever been mutually exclusive in this world, and I don't think they're any less so now. I mean, I think we need m more faith than ever. So, um, I mean, people have asked me that question before. I, I, don't, I don't see the, the paradox. I, I, I really, really don't. Um, I mean, I think it's especially important, frankly, you know, as an engineer, for scientists and engineers, people in technology to have, have faith because, you know, I think with that faith comes an expectation of kind of an ethical and moral responsibility to um, to humankind and to our to our planet, and you know, I'd rather have scientists and engineers who have that in mind as they think about applications of, of the of the technology and to have the faith that there is a God, and that the Easter story you know, re really is true that Jesus died and rose um, for for us. So uh, you know I, I I can't give you a more precise answer than that, but I, I don't I guess I, I don't see the paradox. So you talked about after grad school um, and your, your first wife, you wanted to, you kind of wanted to marry your graduate school experience. Uh, that's kind of what you yeah. determined it was. Um, for someone who's going to be graduating college pretty soon, how do you understand the love and like the great experiences that you've had through college and through good times, but transition into new things? Well, I've failed at it. So, um, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, this is you know. In this year, I've traveled across this country and and talked to alums who've been out five years and twenty years and fifty years, and have seen how connected they are to this university, to the Marianist and the Marianist charism, but also to um, to each other, to to their to their fellow classmates. So, um, yeah, I I I think it's just you know, exercising wisdom. Um, practicing your faith. I mean, I think some some prayers about is that really the person for me? Uh, looking looking for guidance, and um, you know, p patience never hurt. Right. So um, you know, I I got married again when I was uh, I forget how old, but o older than I was the first time. <laughs> and um, I mean, I was I was patient and thoughtful and. You know, I was confident it was about that person and not the friends around us and not even her, her brother and sister-in-law who were like really close to me. So, you know, I was more conscious about, <laughs> about ma making, making certain. And, you know, my wish to all of you is that even though, you know, 
I benefited from my limp. You know, it's best to have a different kind of limp than the one that I had. So, you know, I would just encourage everyone, you know, to focus on that individual rather, rather than the circumstances and the surroundings and the good feeling you get from whatever it is that's in your environment. So at Dayton, we talk a lot about vocation. And I'm just kind of wondering what you think it means, and especially in regards to this new leap as president. Um, yeah, so that's, that's a good question. I mean, my own story is, so I'm a you know, mechanical and aerospace engineer. I was uh, a pretty good researcher, very successful at getting big research grants, uh, pretty successful at doing the research. Uh, really, teaching is what I was, was best at. Uh, it's kind of the family business. My dad was a biology teacher and then a principal. My mom was an art teacher. So I was kind of in the family business. And I, I loved, 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 loved interacting with students. I mean, I really... You know, the ability to sit with a student and explain some complex phenomenon that they've been struggling with and get them to see them. Oh, boy, that's a feeling that I, that I miss. Um, so I felt that was my calling. But as I became a department chair and then moved into administration, I mean, it really just dawned on me that um, you know, I got greater joy from being kind of further behind the scenes. I mean, you know, I, I think you know, good presidents and provosts and deans and department chairs are those who are kind of solely focused on the success of their students and their faculty. And when, you know, a student wins an award or a faculty member gets promoted or tenured or becomes a member of the National Academy, and if you've had some small role that sometimes the person doesn't even know about in making them successful, I mean, I, I found that that gave me just incredible joy because, you know, the joy went to more people than, than just, just myself, you know, not having yourself in, in you know, your own name in, in, the, in the headlights. So, in the headlines. Um, so, for, for me, um, you know, I would say on vocation, uh, and, you know, I've talked to some students here who are looking for that, you know, that sign that, you know, the discerning, you know, there is my vocation, voila, I, you know, I'm 21 and now I have it for the rest of my life. Uh, it doesn't have to be. I mean, I, I think you can have multiple vocations and ultimately find what is your best vocation to, to do the best you can for the world and for humankind. So for me, um, again, I've, I've told some of the folks here, my job here as president is very different than my job as vice chancellor and provost, you know, independent of the differences in, in the institutions. So, um, you know, I'm, I feel blessed to be here because I've, I mean, I'm bringing together my faith life and my, uh, my professional life. I've always viewed myself as kind of a values-driven leader. Um, and it just all seems to be coming together for me here. So. You know, again, I think faith got me to find my vocation as an administrator, and then faith and, and you know, ultimately trusting uh, got me to kind of my final vocation of, of being a, a president. I, I can't imagine a better job than this one. So I, you know, I would say just don't, don't, don't always think, I mean, don't view any vocation as final. Right? Be, be open to more suggestions from God about what your vocation really is or what your vocation for the next five years or 10 years or or 70 years is going to be. What are some things that you and your wife love that make you happy, that grow your relationship as well as your spirituality? So I'll, I'll name, I mean, the first three things that come to my mind. Um, and what is our, our, our kids? Um, great joy in raising our kids and relishing really every moment, including the difficult moments. I mean, actually, some of the most difficult moments with our kids have been a time when we've been you know, kind of most connected to each other and um, most connected to our, to our faith. So kids, um, being outdoors in, in nature, so we, we love to, to hike, we love... Um, Around here, it's harder to find a mountain, but in New York, you get to mountains very, very quickly from where we were, also to, to lots of water. Um, and then the last thing that really kind of makes us and our family happy, we play a lot of games. 
back in uh, back in Syracuse, we had a game closet that must have been um, 20 feet deep by about six feet wide with shelves from top to bottom. You know, Toys R Us used to come to our house to borrow a game. <laughs> so, to say. so you know, just that kind of kind of being letting our hair down and just you know we're both hyper competitive. She says I cheat. I, I don't. Um, so I mean, so those are the three. Those are the three things. I mean, I think you know probably less spirituality in the games and more fist fights. Um, but the being outdoors and being being in nature and really really appreciating that. You know, boy, there really is a God. I mean, you're out there in nature and you're interacting with people. I mean, that's um, that, and also just the connectivity to each other through our kids. So my question would be, um, actually, I think the first time you and I met last spring, it was very, very hot out, and I don't remember. It was a, it was a secret. It was a secret meeting. It was a secret meeting, <laughs> but um, which is another long story. But the first time you and I met, I, the one thing I remember about it was we had some conversation about if you stay around UD, the UD community long enough, like it will sort of irrevocably shift your, reorient, your, like reorient yourself to opening your eyes to new ways to things. And like, I mean, it looks different for everybody. Like for me, I think I've been around you dating like five and a half years now and change. And I think I, the thing I have learned thus far is that I, I like take more time for people now in ways I never learned to in Chicago when I was growing up. So for you, now that you've been here almost a year, would you say, does anything come to mind of sort of like one way that your like day to day has shifted or one thing that the Dayton community has sort of like imperceptibly put in your life? Yeah, that, that's easy. So uh, I'll just talk to the video for a moment. That question was so long I can't possibly <laughs> capture it. <laughs> Um, <laughs> the, the, the question really is, you know, has being in the Dayton community kind of sh shifted my, my perceptions in, a, in any way? Um, so I, I, absolutely. I mean, in, in a lot of ways, but I think in one overarching way, and I'm not, I'm not playing to the crowd here. Um, you know, it's a complex world right now, d difficult world, complex country, difficult country in, in some, some respects. Um, you know, less tolerance for, for each other, more, more war, more unrest, greater hunger. Um, I mean, it's just, you know, I think we've all become aware over the last couple of years that, that it's, you know, the world is a, you know, refugees. I mean, it's just really a tough, tough place. Um, you know, there's lots of reasons to be, for an old guy like me, um, you know, kind of be down in the mouth and be despondent. Um, but since I've interacted with the students here, I actually have more hope about the future than I could have possibly imagined. I mean, the students who are in this room, the students I've met at this university, um, I think are, are remarkable um, in, in your faith, in your Really, your framing of your education as about as about other rather than about about self. Um, you know, I think very few of you are here to make sure you make as much money as you possibly can when you graduate. Now, that doesn't mean you don't want to make a living, and you you should. Um, it helps our rankings, by the way. Um, <laughs> but but the students who I've interacted with here invariably when we're talking about what they're doing, what they're volunteering in while they're here, what they want to do um, and as, as a profession, it really is about something positive about other and rather than, than self. And if, you know, I truly believe, and I've said this to folks at other, you know, I've said it to family and, and friends who, who are despondent about the state of the country and the state of the world, and I've said, it, it's okay. Um, D Dayton has it. We we got we have the leaders. Uh, we have folks who will give you hope and give give you faith, and um, you know. So so that for me, I mean, that's the really obvious answer. That you know, one of the reasons why Karen and I love being here so much. Really, all of you give us just a heck of a lot of of hope, in, in a time when it can be sometimes hard to find. So you, obviously through your profession and everything that you've done and then you coming here, you see the 
that like you can always, like you said with vocation, there's always like another thing, you're never stuck. And so with this university, and we've spoke about so many amazing things here, our community and our faith life, where do you see, I know you've done tons of visioning things, with the faith life here, it growing and becoming even bigger, and I don't know how, but do you have a vision for movement forward and not just staying still and where we're at, but continuing to pursue greatness? So this year, you know, we did this whole visioning thing. I went across the country, spent time on, on campus. And so the, the vision that I, I talked about in my speech two weeks ago, which I, I know not everyone has read, but we'll make sure you do by the, by the fall. Um, I mean, it really wasn't Eric Spina up there saying, here's what I think. It really was our alumni. It was our students. It was our faculty. It was our staff. It was the community saying, boy, here's this. Here's this incredible jewel of a university that has this incredible history, that has these strong values, uh, that has a faith component, um, that has really made a difference in this community and in the world. Um, and here's what we can do to, to push that even farther. So you know, I, I used the phrase in my inauguration speech, we're, we're going to double down um, in our engagement locally. Right? So we, we have a city that, um, that provides great benefits to us in many, many ways, including opportunities for many of our students to, to learn about working across difference, to learn about, um, about communities that some of which are broken, others of which are very healthy. Um, and, and we have a lot of intellectual capital up here at, at the university. And you know, one, one way that I envision us continuing to get better and you know, making real this notion of you know, how can we make the world a better place? I and mean, we first need to make our direct community a better, a better place. We're, we're, we're going to find ways to, to double down on the engagement between our students, our faculty, and our staff, and the community. And not in a way that's like, OK, you know, we're here to fix you. I mean, we have much more to gain by engaging with the community than, than we have to give. But we also have, we also have uh, skills and, and gifts to give. You know, so at the at the heart of that is you know about about leadership about uh, about preparing leaders uh, faith-filled leaders to lead uh, value-driven lives. Um, well, it's also be about innovation and, and creativity um, related to social transformation, but also related to creating ventures on the on in uh, West Dayton and um, you know, really thinking about ways we can advance ourselves as a research university, um, but also by contributing to the community in a significant way. So, I mean, there's other things, but as, you know, as I think about my answer to the previous question, I mean, it really does tie to this. The world needs us. We, we need our students to be even better prepared to be leaders in, in the Marianist um, model of working across difference, of putting ourselves in spots that sometimes are comfortable and, and working, working through that to make a community, whether it's you know, a, a neighbor, uh, a block in a neighborhood, or whether it's a city, or whether it's a state or the country, we need to better prepare our students to make that difference. Because I think this university is uniquely positioned to, to really have a profound, to make a profound difference. So talk about how you're a little hesitant initially um, when considering UD about uniting your faith life and your professional life. Mm -hmm. What kind of pushed you to take that plunge? And do you think it's really necessary to kind of have that unification between those spheres in your life? I know you said that you went to um, the Catholic grade school mm -hmm. and the Jesuit mm -hmm. high school. Do you really think it's kind of important to have like your faith as um, part of like your education and you know um, that kind of more professional aspect? I'm going to speaking pretty literally on on purpose, um, but I you know as I took a, a sabbatical um, in preparing to determine whether or not I want to be a president. I mean I really thought a lot about my leadership style and what I like to do and what kind of people I like to work with, and you know I, I got to a place where even before I really considered possibly uh, going to a Catholic university. Um, I, I recognize that I, I really try hard to be a values-based leader, and my values are you know, the values that I grew up with in my parents' house and my, Jesu my Jesuit high school, um, you know, in, in, my, in my church. So um, 
you know, st strictly speaking, you know, they were never really separated. They were always intertwined. Um, but, but, you know, let's face it, when you're leading or a leader in a secular private university, you, know, you really can't sign a memo, you know, God, God bless. Um, I mean, even people from time to time, if you'd sign something, you know, if someone's going through a difficult time, you know, you're in my prayers. I mean, you'd get sometimes some blowback. So it was kind of more of a formal separation um, that I saw. But, you know, I, I talked to enough leaders of Catholic universities to know that I think if you're going to be successful as a president of a Catholic university, you really need, and I'm, I'm still working on this, <laughs> you need to integrate your Catholicism into your life. I mean, your faith life needs to be visible for the community. Uh, my wife and I go to, um, go to church here on campus rather than any number of parishes that are in, in the area. In part because we really love being in the community, but in part because I think it's also important for me to be vi visibly living a, a faith life. So, I mean, and that's something that I'm not, not used to. Um, you know, I, I didn't used to hide in church, but I wasn't the president of Syracuse University. I was just, you know, I was Eric who lived a couple blocks over. Um, so, you know, I think I, ideally, you know, I think all, all of you, and I, I know all of you will, um, you know, when you're working for a company or a not-for-profit or a university or a city government or what have you, I'm really confident that you're going to live your, your faith life. Really, the question is, you know, can you, can you put it on the door? Right? At Syracuse, I couldn't put it on the door. Here, here, I, here I can. And it's, there's a lot of joy in it. And I, you know, I, I didn't, didn't fully appreciate just kind of being as open and you know, kind of crossing as much as possible r really brings, brings joy. So you talked about um, the dating community in the sense that you went and you networked with alumni, you know, across the country. So I'm just curious, what is the farthest reaching connection to UD that you've experienced in the globe? So uh, g give me a little bit more. I want to make sure I understand the question. Um, so essentially, when you went and talked to alumni, like, did you find UD's influence in organizations, you know, that far? Or hmm. essentially, what presence did we have? Oh, okay, okay. Um, yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's interesting. So w one of the things that you know, I've recognized is, um, uh, I told you before, I, I didn't know really much about this university other than I was pretty sure it was Catholic. Um, and you know, I think there's a Midwestern humility and a Marianist humility, which is, is, is laudable. I mean, humility, I think, is a great virtue. Um, you know, what I've learned is, you know, if someone has touched UD, right, if they've gone here, if their child has gone here, if an aunt has gone here, they, they know it and they feel it and they understand the qualities. They, they may not be able to articulate the charism, but they can talk about, oh, you know, this, is, this is what's at the heart of the University of Dayton. Um, and, you know, really it's in those contacts that are kind of second or third you know, it's like, oh, my nephew or my nephew's girlfriend went to UD, and here's what I think about it. So, you know, not geographically far, but someone who, you know, didn't experience, who wasn't here for four years, who didn't live in the community, who didn't, you know, in, engage with the, with the vowed religious, they, they still got it, which, t which tells me that that nephew, you know, really lived life as a University of Dayton graduate in the way that we would hope, hope that they would. So, um, you know, and, and basically, you know, what, what I heard in New York and San Francisco and Los Angeles and San Diego and Chicago and Florida and Washington and Philadelphia and Columbus and Cincinnati and wherever else I went was, um, we want more, right? We want you know, less, in, less in Ohio because I think they already get lots of interaction. But New York, San Francisco, um, Los Angeles, I mean, they, they want more of our students to come from there. They want more of our students to do internships there. They want more of our students to get jobs there. They want more faculty to come and give talks. I mean, they, 
there's a hunger for what they what they know of as UD, and that's one of our challenges. Because I want to I want to give them that. I want more students from those places. I want them to hire our students more. Um, so, you know, there's I mean, once you've been touched, even indirectly, I mean, it really makes makes a difference. Thank you to uh, President Sweeney and the So I again want to want to thank the team. You guys really are amazing. You gave me the confidence that I could do this without. Well, maybe I did embarrass myself, but I thought I I thought I could do it without embarrassing myself. So thank you.